here. Welcome, John. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm psyched to be here. This is actually the second time I've given this talk for Mount Shop. Um, so I'm stoked. Uh, and yeah, none of us want to be in that position where we're at the top of an awesome ski and all of a sudden we can't ski. Our ski doesn't want to ski. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some solutions, some common things that might go wrong and then some solutions. Um, so first, who I am. So like Jess said, I'm John Barkhausen. I've been a guide locally for about four or five years and I've been guiding for about 10 years. Um, predominantly skiing and avalanche education. And in the summer, a lot of mountaineering and rock climbing, stuff like that. Um, so this presentation, kind of the goals of this presentation is to talk about the broad range of things that can go wrong. Like they can be totally super tiny and you think that they could be insignificant, but they can still be annoying. So how to fix those things. Um, all the way to huge, like how do we get a broken person out potentially um, or if like your binding pulls out of your ski, like what can you do to still make it back to the car, um, maybe on your skis? Um, so kind of the things that could end up ruining your day, we'll see if we can fix them so they don't ruin your day. Um, we're gonna talk about gear. I'm gonna go through kind of my whole repair kit um, and then plus like some extra items you might wanna bring every once in a while. And then we're gonna talk about those common things that might go wrong and then some solutions that I've seen, that I've tried, that I've thought about. Uh, and then um, at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions. So pretty basic um, setup and I'm not even gonna do a presentation or anything. I just got some notes. Uh, and so we'll just zip through and talk about that stuff. Um, so I'm gonna push you a little farther away here so that I can show you some items. Um, so first we're gonna talk about stuff you might bring in your repair kit. Um, and what I can do is I can also share this kit um, with Jess and maybe she can push it out on social media or something like that um, so people could have it. Um, but a few kind of key items. This is kind of like my most commonly used going down to my least commonly used, but stuff I still carry. Um, the first is ski straps, um, especially if they're branded with the mountain shop, which I'm sure some of these are. Um, but these ski straps, I think they were first made by Volet and now they're made by a lot of different companies. Um, they're really versatile. They're like a really hard elastic um, rubber. They've got all these holes, so they're like really adjustable. They're really easy to use. Um, you just thread it through, put the hole through the metal thing, and then that's awesome. And they come in a bunch of different lengths. I usually keep one or two accessible. Um, so maybe in the brain of my pack, you can wrap them around your ski pole. Um, so they're kind of at the ready. And then I keep some really long ones kind of nice and tight. Um, I just, this, I just wrap in a circle and do them with a rubber band so that they don't take up a bunch of room in my repair kit. Um, but some of these are like really crazy long. Like this one is super long. Um, and then we have another one. Oh, there you go. Mountain Shop logo. Um, another super long one. So these long ones can be really helpful for some of those bigger repairs, like uh, boot, boots that break and things like that. Um, strapping a boot to a ski, something like that. So a wide variety of these. I would say two at the minimum, um, maybe like six at the most. Six would be a lot to carry. Uh, the next one is a pole basket. Um, <laughs> I like that. Definitely carry stuff as much as possible with the Mountain Shop logo. Um, this is probably my most frequently used repair kit item, um, maybe outside the ski strap. But a pole basket is super light. It's really only used for one thing, and that's for putting on the end of your pole. But if you don't have it and you're trying to ski down, especially in soft snow, that can like be so frustrating. Um, and so it's just a super easy thing to carry. You can get any kind. I think I pulled this. I think I actually found this while skiing once, but otherwise you can just pull it off a different pole. Um, this one's actually sold by Black Diamond. It has the um, threads on the bottom. So you can thread it onto any Black Diamond pole, um, or you could shove it and tape it onto any pole um, that you might have out there. So this can be super useful. Um, also a great way to impress folks. So if somebody else loses their basket, you're like, hey, boom, you owe me a beer. Um, so it can be a nice thing to carry. 
Um, speaking of polls, this is also an item that I have used fairly frequently, this Frankenstein piece of gear. Um, so this is my pole splint, and I'm going to explain more about how to use this later. But basically, it's just about a third of a soup can or a coconut milk can with a couple of pipe clamps on it. Um, and this can be a really helpful thing for if a pole breaks in the field. Again, this is kind of a one usage case, um, but it can be really nice to have if that happens to you. Um, having a couple pieces of cord can be really nice. Um, a short piece for just kind of like run of the mill type stuff. And then a longer piece, I bet this is in the 30 feet range. Um, can be nice for some bigger repairs. So maybe this would be more of like a longer day or a multi-day trip. Um, but cord is, is a little bit more versatile um, than something like a ski strap. Um, but you have to know kind of how to use it, knots to tie with it, things that are going to work. And I'll show you a couple of things you can use the cord for um, in a little bit, but very useful. Also good for like fixing a backpack. If you break a backpack strap or something like that, you can use cord to hold your backpack down. Um, one I don't actually have access to because I've used it recently um, is bailing wire. So a really thin gauge wire that you can bend with your hands. You don't need like a tool to bend. Um, that can be really useful too because occasionally you need to make something rigid. So it's like having cord, but it then stays rigid after you set it up. So a good use case there is like a buckle on a binding, if I completely tore out this strap here or this cable, then maybe I could thread some of that billing wire around a bunch of times and make a loop. And then I can use a ski strap around with that loop to tighten my boot potentially. So um, it can be like, it can hold a shape, which is nice. And they can be really small. Um, you That's embarrassing. That was my air compressor. I'm also in a wood shop, so ignore that. <laughs> um, you can use coat hangers, um, but those that that metal is a little bit stiffer, so a little bit hard to work with. So something thinner than a coat hanger um, works pretty well. Okay. Next up is batteries. So spare batteries. Um, so. Everything that I own, so this is my little trick that I have with batteries. Um, a lot of us use things that use batteries. A lot of the stuff we use now that has batteries have special batteries, like a phone um, or like a watch. But still, my beacon, my headlamp uses regular old batteries. And they both use AAA batteries. And they both use three AAA batteries, which is nice. Um, so what I do is I open a new package of batteries and I tape them into this little pod of three batteries. So now I know anytime I see a, a set of three taped together, that's a brand new battery. And that can go into my um, beacon. It can go into my headlamp if I needed to. Um, and it's really nice. That way when I take out the old batteries and I have my little repair kit bag still out and I don't wanna deal with where do I put these old batteries so I don't get them confused with my new batteries. I'll just throw them in the kit because if it's a loose battery, I know it's a bad battery. So that's my little trick there. And it doesn't mean I have to dig around for three batteries. Find good ones. Um, to go along with batteries, having a headlamp, and I actually carry a spare headlamp in my repair kit. Um, again, maybe that's more for a longer day or a multi day thing or something like if you're a guide or an instructor. Um, but having an extra headlamp. Um, can be really, can be really nice. If you, if you break a headlamp, if someone you're with forgot their headlamp or loses their headlamp or breaks their headlamp, um, you have a second one. I have definitely put my second headlamp to use. I've also used my second headlamp in a situation where I actually forgot my primary headlamp, but because it lives in my repair kit, I still had one and I needed it. So 
um, a headlamp that actually lives in your repair kit can be really nice. Um, a lighter can be really important. So if you have to start a fire for whatever reason, if you have to fuse an end of a cord, um, then you can use a lighter for that. Um, work a stove, you might need a lighter. Uh, make sure the lighter works. I was actually going to be like, oh, I'm going to test, I'm going to show people my lighter working. But this means that my light is broken, so I have to replace it for my repair kit. Um, so make sure it works before you're out in the field and you realize, oh, I wish I had a working light. I'm going to have a broken one. Um, oh, some kind of ratchet. So these two, so I have a Leatherman set of pliers with a bunch of tools, and then I have a ratchet system. So this is specifically sold for skis, or I think it's for snowboarding. Um, it has a variety of bits that go in there. And these bits just fit right into the end. And then it works like a, like a socket wrench. So it'll spin. I can adjust which direction it actually moves in. And it's a really great way to actually crank on someone's bindings. And that could be a snowboard binding, that could be a ski binding, um, as long as I have the right bits. Uh, I can adjust the din, I can adjust the size of bindings that have an adjustable size heel, and I've used it for all of those things. Um, and so it can be a really useful thing. The one place where you're gonna get hung up is if you have a critical piece of gear and you don't have a bit that fits that critical piece of gear. So for example, all of my bindings have what are called quiver killer inserts. And I'm gonna show you those in a little bit. But basically that means I have a special screw that attaches my binding to my ski. And all of those special screws have special heads, which means I need a special bit um, to operate those screws. So I make sure I carry that bit with me. Um, so again, pretty useful thing to use, especially if you're a snowboarder. Um, the Leatherman can also be really useful. So if you have nothing that really needs a ratchet, then you can just rely on the screwdriver in the Leatherman. But the thing in the Leatherman I've used the most is the pliers. So I can you know, bend the wire that I was talking about or cut it. I've definitely used it for that. Or I can fiddle with someone's gear. Or I can do little micro things with the pliers. Um, and I have the cutters. I can use the, the wrench part of it, very versatile. And the other thing I've used a lot of is the knife. So it can just be nice to have a knife um, when you're out in the field. So cutting cord or cutting fabric or whatever, it's nice to have a knife. But this thing also has flathead screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver, can opener. I've actually used the can opener quite a bit, which is nice. Um, so I'd say this is probably an everyday carry, even though it's a little bit heavy. Um, you might be able to get away with, with this instead, depending on your, your usage. Um, Maybe you carry both of these every day. As a guide, I carry both of these every day, but as if you're going out just for fun, you might not need both. They're heavy. They're probably almost a pound each together, maybe a little bit more than a pound together. So, um, but they can be both very useful. And this isn't the only brand. I don't know even know what brand this is. Um, Black Diamond makes, makes one. Um, lots of people make these little ratchet things. Uh, baby sack. So this is more of an emergency than a break, but I carry just one of these little, um, you know, it's like a silver sleep emergency sack. Um, it'll keep you slightly warmer than not having it. I'm not going to open it because once you open these, they'll, they will never, ever go back into the bag. Um, but it can be very nice in a bad situation. Um, especially if you're up high on Mount Hood and um, somebody falls and hurts themselves and you need help, it's going to be hours and hours before you actually get help to you. So it can be nice to be able to stay warm until that help gets to you. Um, again, maybe just for bigger days, maybe not so much on the smaller days. Um, cool. So next is a bunch of little bits of hardware and other things. So my most exciting, um, actually, I also have these alternative straps. So these are a lot like um, ski straps. These are actually made by Outdoor Research. 
Um, they're mostly, I remember these are C to Summit. I always thought these were outdoor resources. These are C to Summit, but they have a little friction toggle thingy on one side, kind of operates like a belt buckle. Um, I have used these things so much, um, mostly to attach things to people's backpacks, but they could also be used to like tighten up someone's boot around their ankle. Um, they're not super strong, it's just fabric, but it's pretty strong. Um, and uh, yeah, they're just a really nice little product. Um, and then I have um, this set of hardware in this little box. So I'll open this up. This is just a very small little pack. This is actually very heavy and you'll see why in a second. I'm just going to tilt this down. Um, so this is sort of my hardware kit. There's a lot of little bits and pieces in there. And what I have is, I'll save those for later. One is I have a bunch of random wood screws. So wood screws are kind of this open thread at the bottom with a nice pointed tip. It's a Phillips head so I can put it in with my ratchet. I've got bigger ones. I've got ones with a different head style. And what I use these for is if I need to screw something into somebody's ski, I can use a wood screw. And so I can potentially reattach a binding. Um, I can potentially make a rescue sled. Um, they can be useful um, in the right case. I also have a little drill bit that would help me do that. So I can drill with this little drill bit and my ratchet um, and actually drill a little pilot hole um, for those screws. I also have washers that could operate with those wood screws. Um, and I have these giant bolts. So with those giant bolts, I have a much bigger drill bit. It's actually the right size for this bolt. And so with those two combined, I could drill a hole in someone's ski and I could put this bolt through it. And I could attach to that bolt some other kind of rigid piece. So maybe it's a shovel handle that I also drill a hole in. Maybe it's a stick um, to potentially make a rescue sled. Um, so that can be a really nice thing to have in the wrong type of situation. So I've never had to use that, um, but I've definitely um, thought about how I would. I've seen people do it um, and it can be a, a pretty awesome little feature. I also did some research. I actually came to the mountain shop once and spent a bunch of time with Eric going through a, a box of bolts. This is the replacement screw for snowboard bindings. Um, and they're pretty generic. They definitely fit all the rental fleet at the mountain shop. Um, and they would also fit quite a few other brands and styles of, of snowboard. Um, and so the reason I grabbed those is because this is actually a pretty common thing to fall out. And I've used these um, and just replaced them for, you know, you hand someone a screw and then all of a sudden they can actually snowboard again and go down the mountain. So especially if you split board, um, you should have a little screw that fits with your binding into your ski. You just carry three or four extras. Um, and you could help yourself or you could help somebody else. This is that, this is the thing that adjusts the screws in my ski. So I do carry, this tightens the screws um, that attach my bindings to my ski. So I make sure that I also have that little bit. That's my little hardware kit. Um, this is definitely like not an everyday thing. It is heavy, um, but on like an expedition or even just an overnight, especially as a guide, if I'm guiding a ski day, um, this could get me out of a lot of jams. But on the smaller days, it might just be easier to find a way down the mountain or call for help or, or whatever. But this can, this can help you if you're way out there. Um, so I have it at the ready and I bring it when I think it might be a good idea. Um, I also carry a variety of adhesives every once in a while. Um, again, this might be more for the expedition style, although this is just a tiny little tube of super glue. 
Um, I keep it inside a plastic bag just because if it popped inside my repair kit, that would make me very sad. Um, but I used to have more in here and then I've used them on a, a couple of occasions. I like to get the tiny ones because then they're just one time use. I don't have to re think about resealing it. Um, and super glue can be really helpful, especially if someone has a screw that won't stay screwed down. You can put a few drops of super glue in there and then screw it in and that'll hold it nice and tight. Um, it can actually, if you've stripped some wood a little bit, it might help hold a screw in that same hole. Um, and you can fix sunglasses or goggles or maybe even a zipper pull, something like that. Um, easily with super so that can seem to carry it so light. If you need to go up a step from that, I might carry this. This is a two-part epoxy. So this is JB Weld. It's a very strong, um, pretty pliable epoxy. Um, and it actually has metal sort of in it. So that makes it very strong. Um, so this can be a nice thing for like much beefier repairs. So that same scenario where someone a screw is stripped out and their binding is falling off. Well, I could fill the holes with this stuff and that'll help hold the screws in and be very strong. Um, I might be able to reattach something to a boot, potentially as long as it's not too high stress. Um, so these can be super useful. Um, the next step up from that is this. This is called a steel stick. Um, and they have a variety of versions of this product. Um, but this is basically the same kind of stuff. It's a two-part epoxy, so you see the gray and the black. And so what you do is you just pinch off a bit that you need, and then it's like molding clay at that point. Um, so you mix it up, mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it, and then you form it into a shape, and then it holds that shape and is very, very strong. Um, I was on Denali last year, and I made, we broke the handle of our dip cup for our water, and I made a new handle out of this stuff. And it worked for a while. It worked for five or six days. Um, so this stuff can be really helpful, probably more of an expedition style um, repair item. Uh, zip ties. Zip ties can be really helpful. These are a couple of longer, thicker ones. And then I have a few skinnier ones. Um, they can just be really helpful in a pinch just to really quickly do like, like a bunch. It's like having ski straps, but you can like really crank them down. Um, and if you have a bunch, they're really light. Um, and so they can, they can help in a bit, in a pinch. I have these two long ones. One reason I have two of them is because if I need a really long one, you can connect them. I'm not going to do it because once you do it, it's permanent, but you just slot the end of one into the little holder of the other, and then it can go around and slot the other one. So that can be really helpful. Um, and then the last thing, I actually do have some other epoxy. I don't carry a tube like this with me. Um, but a good trick if you're doing a repair at home, um, you might want to think about using a longer set epoxy. Um, shorter set epoxy, so you know they have five minute epoxy is the classic style of two part epoxy. Um, they even have two minute, I think, for people in a real rush. Um, what I learned recently is that the faster the set time, the more brittle the epoxy. And so if you have something that has a lot of vibrations or a lot of movement or a lot of flex in it, you don't want a brittle epoxy. And so having something, this is a two hour marine grade epoxy. And so it's going to be a lot more flexible. And so if I have to do a repair at home, I'll use this. Um, I'll also use this for putting the quiver killer inserts in, which I'll talk about later. Um, Oh, and then the proverbial duct tape, forgot, almost, almost forgot. So I wouldn't bring a roll of duct tape. What I do is I wrap a bunch of duct tape around my ski pole, um, and then you have enough and it's at the ready. Duct tape's okay, useful. It can help in a pinch. Um, you can do like a quick patch on a down jacket. Um, but in the cold, especially, it doesn't do a ton. Um, but you can probably find some pretty good uses to help fix it. I'll also carry electrical tape um, from time to time. Electrical tape can be really helpful. It's a little bit better than duct tape, not with the adhesion because 
the adhesive actually doesn't work super well in the cold either, but it sticks to itself really well. And it's really, it's stretchy. So you can stretch it like a rubber band and it actually has greater pull um, in it. And so let's say you have to like fix a, you want to replace or do a makeshift bootstrap to hold your boot on and you have a roll of electrical tape, you can just really crank it around your boot a bunch of times and that'll hold your boot on pretty snug. It'll be hard to get off, but if you'd rather ski down the mountain than worry about how do you get this tape off my boot, then electrical tape can be super helpful. But again, it gets a little bit brittle if it's really cold. Um, under freezing is fine, but if you're getting close to like zero or in the negatives, it might be too brittle to really work with. Um, other than that, it's a very useful tool. And then I also have skin wax and, and rub on wax. It's just a regular, you can buy skin wax, you can buy rub on wax, but I find it just buying a really generic ski wax um, is just fine. And I'll rub it on the bottom of my ski. I'll rub it on the bottom of my skin if I'm getting some glopping on the bottom of my skin. And we're in glop season right now, so you can get ready for that. Um, and you just literally take a piece and you just rub it on. Um, I also like to bring a scraper. Um, and it could be a, this type of scraper. I also bought this. I saw it at New Seasons, and it was like 99 cents. And it's just a dish scraper. But it's got a really nice, sharp edge. And so it's lighter than this one. Um, and it works just as good. So this can get like, if you have glue sticking on the bottom of your ski, you can use this and it'll help pull that glue off. You can also scrape off ice off the bottom of your ski or off your skin or something like that. So having a little scraper. Um, on the right days, so days where maybe there's a fresh snow and it's gonna get warm, um, or maybe we're dealing with ice on skins or something like that, I'll actually pull this out of my repair kit, this whole situation and throw it in the brain of my pack because I can almost guarantee that I'm gonna deal with glopping and I'm gonna to wanna to scrape the snow off and I'm gonna to wanna to rub some wax on it. Um, so you can kind of think ahead on the gloppage there. And that's kind of all the stuff that I carry in my repair kit. Um, if you have other items that you carry or you're curious why I don't carry, um, throw them in the comments and I will address them as we get to them. Um, there's always other people who have really interesting ideas. So I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. Um, cool. Now we are going to progress into talking about some common repairs and how to maybe do that. Clear myself some space. Open my notes. Um, okay. So first we're going to talk about holes and talk about things that can go wrong with ski poles. Um, a few different things can go wrong. You know, these aren't necessary for skiing. For skinning, I would almost call them necessary, but you can get away with not having a pole. If you could have one pole and like survive. Um, skiing down, you could probably get away without a pole. But if you have a heavy backpack on, or if you're going a long way, or if you've never, um, Um, or if you've never skied without a pole, then you might want to uh, make sure you know how to fix one. So there's a couple different styles. Um, this is the kind with the flick lock and it slides out. And we'll also talk about the kind where you spin it and that locks it. Um, but the first repair we're gonna talk about is the basket. So let's say you lost a basket. Some of the black diamond ones, it's really simple and they just literally screw off. And so if you lost one, all you gotta do is screw a new one on. So there you go. You just kind of got a pull on it and then it unthreads. But let's say you don't have the kind that has threads. Then what do you do? How do you keep it on there? Well, you can put it on and then you can have a ski strap and I would recommend if you can get the street strap on both sides of the pole, um, but definitely if you can get it underneath, that would be ideal. You can also do electrical tape and wrap a bunch of electrical tape underneath the basket until the pole becomes so thick that the basket can't slide off anymore. Um, and usually there's a cap above it so the, pull, the basket can't slide any farther up the pole, but if there isn't, then you wrap tape underneath and you wrap tape above and then you're good to go. 
Um, you could epoxy it on if you wanted it to be perfect, but chances are your pole fix isn't going to last for very long. So, like, you know, replacing a basket. Um, you could also duct tape, you know, all that stuff would potentially work. You just got to hold it on there. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, if you have one of the spinning styles, so this is the next repair. So if you have a spinning style and it's just spinning and not locking, I've seen that mechanism break a bunch of times, then that's gonna be really easy. Just get it to the length you want and then duct tape the hell out of it. Just wrap it over and over and over again and, and get it to where it's not going up. Um, what I would also recommend doing is make it slightly longer than the length you want and then tape it because likely what's gonna happen is it is gonna move a little bit, but maybe it'll suck some of that tape into the wider um, pole section and then, it, then it'll jam. So you don't want it to do that and then be an inch too short or whatever. So that's a pretty easy way to, to fix those, those types of poles. Although they're not really making those poles anymore or not free, I don't see them as frequently anymore. Um, the last one, sorry, we're not done with poles, is the pole splint. So how do you use this pole splint? So, Here's that pole splint again. So soup can with two pipe clamps. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lower this so you can see. I have my ratchet, and open it. And these have a flat head screw. I don't know if you can see that, flat head screw head. So I'm gonna get my flat head bit out. Put that one back, so there's my flat head bit. So there you go, flathead bit. I'm gonna make sure it's on the, need to loosen it. And then you come in and you just put it in there. And you loosen, 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 loosen. And then you, until you can pull the pipe clamp off the can. And then you do it again. can and then what I would recommend is come in here and open them as wide as they will go as big as they will possibly go because what you're going to do next is you're going to take this can and you're probably going to need a set of pliers you're going to open it up And it's nice, it's stiff, that's nice because you want it to be stiff. You're gonna open it up kind of as big as you can make it, not as big as you can make it, but big enough to go over your pole, right? And let's say my pole here is, has broken. I'm gonna slide one pipe clamp on first. I'm gonna slide the soup can on, then I can slide my other pipe clamp on. You can even slide this pipe clamp over the, the top, the upper section of the broken piece. Then you're gonna put them back together, right? And I don't actually have a broken pole, so it's a little hard to show exactly how that would look, but. And then you tighten this can as tight as you can, and then you get those pipe clamps back over the sides, and then you crank, 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 and tighten them as much as you can. And once those pipe clamps tighten down on that can, it becomes really, really rigid, and so the pole can't like as easily. Um, it is not an absolutely perfect fix. It's not going to be as strong as your pole was before, but it is good enough to like give you that pressure as you're skiing downhill. Um, some things you can do to help this be more effective is when you have your broken piece, hold it together as best you can right in that position and then wrap it in duct tape or wrap it in electrical tape. Hold it still while you put the can on 
all of that tape also gives the can something to grab onto so it won't move around. And if you want to get really fancy, if you can find a stick that will fit inside of your pole, so you have your broken sections, you put a stick in, and then you slide this other section up on top of that stick until they meet again. Now you have a rigid thing on the inside that'll also help it from bending. So if you can do the stick inside, wrap with duct tape, and this can over the outside, then you're golden. Again, on that same Denali trip, I actually used this same steel stick stuff. I made a little like epoxy rod, put it inside of someone's pole, and then we held it together and we duct taped it and let the epoxy dry. Then we put the can on and the pole, it broke again, but it actually broke above the can. Um, so we decided it was just not a good pole, um, but it, very effective. So that fix can absolutely work. So on days where I think a pole might be critical, like if you're skiing a pretty serious line or something like that, then it can be really nice to have a pole splint. Um, cool. So that is my, all the pole fixes, that I had, things I've seen go wrong with poles. Moving along. Boot repairs. So I'm a skier. So most of the boot repairs that I talk about involve ski boots. Um, and I found that snowboard boots don't have a ton that can break on them. They're mostly, you know, laces and things and they're soft anyway. Um, but ski boots have all these fancy plastic buckles and metal buckles that can break um, and other things that can go wrong. So one thing that could happen is you could have a broken buckle. So let's say, you know, my boot has this ratchet buckle around the front here. So this is the thing that really compresses on my shin and holds my boot into the ski. Without that buckle, it's gonna be really hard to ski. So if I don't have it, like what do I do? How do I make it tight? Well, I have a few different options. One is this super long ski strap. So I can bring the ski strap around put it right about where my buckle was and then crank it nice and tight. And if I don't think that's gonna be enough, then I can do a second one right above it. And so that can be a super easy way to do a buckle. If the buckle that broke, is down here, then you can do the same thing, but you're gonna want your strap to go right into the arch of your foot so that it's not interfering with your binding operation. But again, same deal. And you can pull that nice and tight. So very simple, seems like a catastrophic failure. And for the longevity of your boot, it might be catastrophic. You might not be able to long-term repair that, but in the short term, um, that's a pretty easy fix. Um, I've also seen, like I said before, you could also do something with bailing wire. And so if you were on like a multi-day trip and this was day one and you wanted to continue to like take your boot on, like like take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, and, or like loosen it for walk mode, then you could potentially do something with that bailing wire and make a loop and then have something that maybe ties in the back, comes back around to that billing wire and then you pull that tight. The other trick that I've seen is you can do a trucker's hitch with this cord. So let's say you don't have any ski straps or you just can't get the ski straps tight enough. This is a way to actually get a very tight strap. So what I'm doing is I'm just tying an overhand knot on one side of this cord and then I'm gonna hold it tight here. And I'm gonna do a bunch of wraps around my boot. And I could be going up and down a little bit if I wanted to. Pull it tight as I go along. As I, once I get far enough, and I'm like, okay, 
I'm ready to really cinch this thing down. I don't want to break into my book open. Then I take this end, pass it through that loop and go back against the way I was just wrapping. So now I'm actually pulling greater tension on all those wraps. Then I pull, 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 pull. And I pull it super, super tight and then I can tie it off. Now I've created a really tight, strong strapping system. That is like as tight as I can get my buckle on there. Um, so that's another great solution there. And if I was gonna finish this, um, a lot of times when you finish a trucker set, you go right by the knot. And so I'd probably go right there, tuck this under, and then tie it off just a couple overhands and that'll hold it really nice. So that's another, that's another good one. If you don't have ski straps or you want it slightly, you know, if you want to get it really, really tight and be able to mechanically crank on it. Um, I've also heard of people using really large pipe clamps. Um, I've never carried one that big, but they look a lot like this, but they're like eight inches around. So you could thread that around your boot and then really crank it down. Um, but I haven't, I know some guides that carry those, but I've never carried those. Um, yeah, so that's if you have a broken buckle. The next thing that's a common break is this axle piece right here. So there's one in the front and the back. It's the thing where your boot pivots. Um, and it can be a bummer, especially if you're trying to go into walk mode and you can't walk. Um, that's a very challenging thing to fix in the field. Um, but you could pull your boot out or your liner out, sorry. And then thread something through this hole where it broke. Cause usually if, when they break, they shear and then they kind of just pop out in both directions. So thread something through and then tighten them back down. So for me, I could potentially use um, some of the bolts that I have. In a pinch, I could use those really long ones. Um, you can also carry specific bolts um, that, you can, that you can tighten down. Um, some people recommend carrying like T-nuts, like a nut that would go on the inside. And they're, it's like what you see in climbing walls. So it's like what climbing holds are attached to a wall with. So they're really flat on the inside. And then you push that in and then you can screw a bolt in from the outside. Um, that's another way that you can fix that potentially. Um, they're not amazing fixes. So that's why I don't have those pieces of gear because even if I do that, I'm still gonna get a lot of slop in here. And so I'm gonna have to figure out some other way to affix this boot to someone's foot. So I usually just go straight to the like, strap the heck out of it to someone's boot. You're never, you're not going to get any more flexation in there really. Um, but at least you'll be able to have a boot on your foot if that breaks. That's like a leave the field immediately kind of break. Um, unfortunately, but those are some options. Ideally you'd be able to, to fit something through here. If I had to, I might take the steel stick and then make a blob and have the blob go through and all the way around. And then really strap it around so that at least it would hold it in place. Um, cool, and that's kind of the, the boot fixes. Those are, that's, those are the things I've seen go wrong with boots. The next one is skis or bindings. If your ski actually breaks, um, then, then you're kind of in a lot of trouble. It's not a lot you can do with a full on broken ski. Now, if it's just kind of cracked, you can still ski on it. I've seen people do that, but if it like snaps in half then you're kind of in trouble. Um, so let's say, let's go back up here. So the first one, which I've seen and I've done is your binding actually pulls out of your ski. So you actually like your binding pulls out of your ski. Um, usually happens when you're skiing super hard and you go off a drop or something like that. 
Um, but it can also happen, especially if your ski is older and maybe it wasn't installed properly, um, you can pull the binding out of the ski. Um, so one option is like I have on my bindings, you have little threaded inserts and you carry extra threaded inserts and some epoxy. So this, this is called a quiver killer. So it's this little threaded insert, looks like that. So there's wood threads on the outside and machine threads on the inside. Um, it actually makes it a lot less likely to pull out your binding um, because the threads are a little bit bigger than your standard screw thread and you epoxy them into the hole. Um, and so it's a very strong connection. And then my skis, my bindings are attached to my ski um, with machine screws. So they're just a screw like this. I had to buy a pack of a billion, um, but they, they're just the regular machine screws. So um, if I pulled out the binding and I had extra inserts, I could re-glue inserts into those same holes um, and potentially put the binding back on and at least be able to get out of the field for that day. So that's only an option if you actually do the quiver killer thing. Um, I've never seen a quiver killer insert binding pull out of a ski. I've only seen regular standard um, binding installation type style pull out of skis. So um, that's not gonna work after the fact. So another option is you take those wood screws that I mentioned and you take either some steel stick or some epoxy and you go to the holes and you fill them with epoxy or steel stick or whatever and then you put those new screws and screw them down into there. Um, that can also work really well. Another way to add some strength to that would be to um, put some steel wool or some kind of additional binder in that hole. One thing that's nice about JV Weld is it actually has steel in it, so it's as if there was steel wool already mixed in. Same with this, but a regular type epoxy like this, you might think about you know mixing in some steel wool, just like crush up some steel wool. Just adds a lot of strength to the epoxy. Um, so that's also a potential option. And the way you would do that is you would you know try to clean the hole. So you could use maybe you could use the drill bit, maybe you could use your pocket knife. Um, and then you potentially take one of these big wood screws. Um, maybe you'd have to add a washer on the bottom of it and use a different style of screw. And you'd put that right, right over it, right into the binding um, and try to glue that in there. Um, if I was in that scenario, um, and especially if it was like a, a high consequence ski or we were like two days away from the car and we had to go two days to get there or whatever, I would probably just like coat the bottom of the binding with epoxy as well. Um, I would probably try to scrape it up with my knife to kind of give the epoxy some to grab, cover the bottom of the binding with epoxy, like really fill those holes with epoxy, just like epoxy everywhere, and then really squish it down, give it a nice long time to set up and cure, probably overnight if you can. Um, and then be really gentle skiing it. Um, I might even do an additional fix that helps hold the person to the ski um, just so we don't pull that binding out again because um, that's pretty critical. Um, but another solution, if you don't have any of those things, you still need a solution. So another way you can do this is you can take your boot let's say if your binding's totally pulled out, you can have it potentially clicked into the binding. You can have it clicked into the binding, um, but obviously remember this heel piece would be loose. Then you could take a ski strap and this is gonna totally destroy your ski ability, but you can at least move. Maybe if you're skinning, this would work really well. You can go literally ski strap to the bottom of the ski. You could figure out a way to go through the back of your boot potentially and to keep it so it holds your heel down because that's really what you need 
is you need a way to hold your heel down. So you could go like maybe through this strap on my, this is my boot specifically, this would work. So maybe I'm going through this strap here. I'm finding a way to go underneath, I might need my longer strap. Um, but you wanna figure out a way that you can pull down um, on the on, on the this binding to hold it down to the bottom of the ski. So you just need a way to really affix um, your boot to the ski. Um, I would probably just end up coming through here with a whole bunch of ski straps, even if it was mostly towards the toe, um, and really strapping these things down. Now, the thing you're going to have to worry about here is as you're skiing. Um, this strap is rubbing right up against these edges. And so you may actually want to maybe cover that the edge with tape before you put the ski strap on so that you don't slice through your ski strap as you're skiing um, or as you're skinning. Um, but when you're in a pinch, you're in a pinch. Um, This is another use for that long um, pipe clamp that I talked about. So that big eight inch pipe clamp that goes here, you can potentially have that go here. And so that metal is not gonna get cut by the um, edge of your ski. And maybe you could get a little bit tighter going down there. Um, you could also figure out a way, see I'm coming up with ideas as we're sitting here. You could also tie the binding to your ski like this. So you could even do another trucker stitch, another ski strap. So you have this pulling in this way. And then you could take a ski strap and hold the binding piece down like that. That would actually be pretty effective too. So same deal. So now you're holding your binding to your boot and then ski strap binding to the ski. Um, that would be pretty effective. So I might do that in addition to the epoxy if it's a really high consequence kind of thing. Bad news bears, if that happens to you. Um, okay, sometimes um, this piece breaks. So if you have tech bindings, you have tech bindings like that, sometimes these posts break or sometimes the rotation breaks. And so you can't get it to rotate anymore. You can't get your boot to affix itself to that heel piece. Well, this is gonna look a lot like what we were just working on. Um, so again, maybe you do a ski strap to your binding. So now your binding is actually attached to the ski, so that's fine. So you can ski strap to the back of your binding. That would work and hold it down there. You could do that same trucker hitch like we just did to the back piece of the binding. That would also work super well. You could do billing wire. You could probably do electrical tape and just like wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. Um, and then all you're trying to do is hold to that heel piece. Um, toe piece is going to be super similar. So let's say you snap one of the bars of your toe piece so your toe won't go in. Um, you can actually get into these bindings pretty effectively by starting with the heel. So a lot of people, obviously you start with the toe and you fail that and then you slam your heel down like I've been doing. But um, you can start by sliding your heel on and then setting it down and then snapping the toe up. So that's, a, that's actually nice for ski mountaineering sometimes. Um, but let's say that snapping system isn't working. Then again, you just have to find a way to strap to that piece. So I'll probably do another ski strap. I've got some really nice holes right here that I might be able to get. Well, if I had a lot of time, I would be able to get that through, but just as effective, I can do some cord. get the cord through these holes in the binding 
It's not quite all the way through, but it's good enough for demonstration. And then you probably just want to focus on the toe. You don't need to pull the boot forward because you don't want to pull it out of the heel piece. Like it can slide out easily that way. So you want to focus just on the toe and you're probably going to end up, you know, wrapping around and under your toe here a bunch of times like that. Trying not to go under the ski if you can avoid it. And then you'd come back and you'd do that trucker's hitch and really crank it down. Um, so that could be that could be an effective way to do that. If you have to, then you could do a ski strap around the toe like that. And around the whole ski and grab the toe and hold the toe down um, to your binding. But Obviously, again, then you have the problem with the strap under the ski, so that's going to slow you down. It's going to be harder to ski. Maybe you slice the strap with your edges, but if you have to, you have to when you're going down. Um, so that's also a possibility. Okay, do I have? Okay. Let's talk for a second about, let me talk quickly about ski repairs. And the big one is skins. Um, you know, if it's, if, like I said, if a ski snaps in half, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, the ski has just snapped. Um, maybe you could stiffen it with a stick or something like that and a ski strap, but otherwise you're probably walking. Um, but if your skins break a little bit, then there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, a common thing that can break is a, like a tip clip. So like the wires might pull out of your skin. Um, these are a special kind of skin, so it's hard for me to show, but um, um, you can use bailing wire for that. So that's another really good use for that bailing wire. So those loops that are in the front of your skin, you can just, make a new fake loop out of bailing wire and then you can either you know refold the skin over you could um tie it on you could glue it on with epoxy um you could wrap that through the old hole so sometimes it's actually the loop that breaks on the skin so you can just wrap the bailing wire through the old hole um and then you still have a, a loop on the front tail clips um, I actually usually carry a, a spare tail clip, but I've used it recently um, and handed it out to somebody. You can replace the tail clip on a skin, or you can just forget about it. A lot of times you don't actually need a tail clip unless you're on like a really steep, steep skin track and you keep sliding backwards, which is pulling your tail out. Or if you get a lot of snow on it and it starts to droop off, um, most of the time tail clip you can do without for most of the day. Now, if your skin is sort of delaminating off the bottom of your ski, then you probably need to do something to help hold it on. Um, the best trick that I know is the main cause of skins, like just dropping off of your skin, or your skin dropping off of your skis, is you have snow and ice built up on your skin. So if that's the case, then what you can do is you can actually take your skin, pull it apart. I usually take my ski and I'll jam it into the snow really far so I can use it like a lever. But then you can take it on the edge side if you need to be really aggressive, or you can do it on the not edge side if you don't have to be quite so aggressive. And then you literally take the glue, put it around the ski, and then you just you pull it really tight. My skins are really sticky right now because they're nice and warm and not iced up. But an iced up skin, you'll be able to scrape it with a lot of force against your ski and it'll break off a lot of that ice. And so that'll make it really nice or um, it'll probably restick at least a little bit. Um, that's a good way to get the ice and the snow off of the sticky part of your skin. Um, you can also do that to the outside, you know, the, the fur side of your skin. If that's not working, 
one day I was skiing in Alaska and it was like negative 20. So our skin glue was just freezing. And so skins were totally useless. Then you can take ski straps and actually strap your skin to the bottom of your ski. Um, and I've had to do this many, many times. Um, you know, it just happens. You want to do it right under your toe um, because that's where the most weight is going to droop the most. And then it's nice to do kind of like most of the way up the ski. Um, you can do it up there to kind of keep the tip on so the tip doesn't fall off. Um, and then if you're having a lot of trouble or if you've lost your tail clip and it's actually causing a lot of issues, then you can do a ski strap you know, around the back. But again, like I said, I find that it's not the end of the world if you don't have a tail clip, at least for a little while. And then you, you strap that on. So a few ski straps, um, you know, can help save your skinning. And obviously you're not gonna have as much glide forward, but it's not gonna hurt your grip at all. because It's actually gonna add a little grip, um, which can be nice. I recommend having the tails going to the outside so they're not tails hitting each other in the middle as you're skinning along. Um, cool, so that's kind of the skin fixes that I had. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is a very, very brief um, introduction to turning a pair of skis into a makeshift sled. Um, that could be like its own two hour webinar just doing that. Um, but I do have a pretty great video that I'll try to copy the link um, into the description. Um, and people can watch it at their leisure. Let's see if this works. Yeah, if it works. Um, so I'll send that um, when I can. And it's basically shows someone, you know, creating a makeshift sled out of a pair of skis. Um, so it's the night, a nice little, it talks about the evacuating of a victim, you know, of an avalanche accident, including, you know, sledding them out of there. Um, so it's nice to have a system ready to go. Whatever your system happens to be, you can buy sleds that you carry. They're like fabric sleds and you drag somebody out. Or you can, you know, come up with a system and carry bolts and drill bits and things like that. Um, but as long as you have a system and you have a plan, then it'll be a lot easier to implement when you're in the field. Um, so for me, my plan is I take the big drill bit, I drill a hole in the tip and the tail of each ski. And ideally, this is the victim's skis, the person, the patient's skis, um, so that I can continue to ski and help them get out. Um, you drill a hole in the front, hole in the back on each ski. And then you have some kind of stiff object that you can also drill holes in. So for me, that might be my shovel handle. So I have the front and I have the back. So I already have the start of one hole here. Um, I can actually probably pull this little presser button out of here. And then I have the start of the second hole. I can try to finish those holes with my drill bit. And then all of a sudden, If I have, push my stuff on, if I have this, and I have this, so I have a hole here and a hole here, and then I can connect them with a stiff object like this or a stick or something like that. And I do one in the front and one in the back. Then I've gone a long way in creating something that can help get these people out of the field. Um, in those videos, and you know, the one I send is good. There's a ton of them on YouTube. You know, you can, they also talk about like cross bracing. So you can take a pole, like lay it across, and you do an X that way and an X this way. And that helps with the rigidity of the sled. And once a person's on there and they're pressed against the bindings, it's also going to help with some rigidity. Um, then you've got a long way to help somebody get out of the field who can't walk anymore. Um, so that's just to kind of more to get your gears working and to talk about why I carry those big drill bits and stuff, and those big bolts. Um, and to let you know, there's more resources out there to learn more about that system. Or, you know, you can look into buying a sled, a rescue sled that you would carry along. Um, cool. That's everything that I have. Um, so now 
if anybody has any questions, um, I would be happy to answer any questions. I didn't see any questions come through. I'm yeah. curious what your um, what your ratchet system is that you have. Like I have the black diamond kit. Yeah. That they make, but it doesn't. My bindings um, need a T20 to tighten them in the back, sure. and they're like Dinafit bindings, and it doesn't come with the T20. So I'm curious what you yeah what you use. So this. I don't know if you, is this the logo of a company? I've never seen this logo before. I don't know. It looks like it, but I don't know I, what it is. And I don't know what brand this is, but what's nice is I actually have a T20 bit over here. Um, it fits any standard um, driver bit. So, you know, if you need a T20, like what this is, it'll actually just fit right in there. And then oh, it'll nice function just the same so you can buy that at any hardware store um so depending on the system that you have um then you can just buy additional bits um, yeah and that's what i did when i bought these drill bits is i made sure to get the type of drill bit that had that same bottom and it's a very okay. standard you know bottom um yeah it's like this okay um but carrying a T20 with me, that's a good idea because I've had a, a guest on a climb who had those same findings, T20 adjustment. And his problem was that they kept loosening on him over time. Uh -huh. So he would have to stop and, and crank it down. And at one point he thought he lost his bit. And so having a spare bit would be really nice. Yeah, those are hard to crank too, just the, especially with that attachment, like, because it's such a small area from where the screw is and where your ski yeah. is it's it's really hard to get in there and crank it but yeah I've definitely had problems with those before and I I didn't it was before I knew like what attachment I needed I just it seems like all this stuff you just really have to look at your gear and like take the time to prepare what you need like what yeah. kind of wrench tightens this what like what screws do you need all this stuff it's like very yeah just looking at what you have and figuring that out before you go out on a trip or go somewhere yeah absolutely like having a really personalized kit um can be a great way to save yourself you can really trim it down like you said like having the right kind of bits and attachments um for your specific setup yeah well thank you so much for sharing sharing what's in your kit yeah. I'm always curious, especially like, yeah, getting, getting knowledge from guides who are yeah doing a lot of their own stuff, but also working with a lot of other people who have different equipment and, um, you know, probably maybe aren't carrying the things that they need. So, um, yeah. So you have something that you put together with like all the gear, a list or something. Yeah. Yep. I have my gear repair list. Um, I could easily send that to you, um, and send that to people. And let, awesome. let me open, this might actually take me a second to find this. Um, it's probably, yeah. If people if just- you don't mind sharing it, I can, uh, I can, in the email, I can send it out in the, in the wrap up email. Um, sure. Or if you have a link to something, and then I could also share that, the and sled that, video. Yeah, the yep. sled video, and then the, I can do my kit. Cool. As well. Yeah, that would be great. That'd be great. Sweet. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Let me just make sure there's no more questions before I. Yeah, I don't see any. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty thorough. I feel like you went through everything that I'm sure there's other things that could go wrong, but I feel like you covered kind of the big things. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. So I will, I will share your Instagram and and the wrap up email, your list, your gear list, and also the video to build the emergency sled. Um, thanks again, we love having you.